Hello and welcome to the full, uh, spring 2022 first lecture of uh, the New York City Category Theory Seminar. Uh, tonight we have my oldest Category Theory friend, Ralph Wojtovich. Um, he's going to talk about logic-based artificial intelligence and categorical logic. Ralph, take it away. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right, Ralph, we have, we, have a, we have a tradition here where you start off saying where you got your degree and... Um, and where you got your undergrad, where you were born, where you got your undergraduate degree, where you got your PhD, and um, and where you're working now. Okay, and um, all right, so I was born in Detroit, Michigan, grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, got my undergraduate degree in math and aero engineering from Rensselaer, and then my uh, master's in engineering and PhD in math from Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana. Um, so I've kind of worked all over. Right now I'm at uh, Shenandoah University, which is um, in Winchester, Virginia, just outside DC. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, take it away. Okay, so some background here. Um, so last fall I had an opportunity to teach an undergraduate AI course for the first time. Um, so I used you know one of the standard texts, this one by Russell and Norvig. Um, we covered about a third of the book. Um, and chapters seven through nine are on logic-based agents. So seven is propositional logic and some algorithms. Chapter eight is first-order syntax. Uh, nine is first-order semantic or first-order algorithms. All right. So the so the chapters that had my attention in trying to prepare for it is are these logic-based chapters. And kind of my goal in preparing for the class was to reformulate these um, using um, Johnstone sequence calculus, right, from sketches of an elephant. Um, so that's what I want to talk about today. Um, right, so you know, some reasons for that is one, I want to be able to identify the fragments of first order logic that are used in the examples and the, um, the algorithms here, um, you know, partly to enable symbolic reasoning about something other than sets, right? So imagine AI agents reasoning directly about graphs or dynamical systems or something. Um, also, I want to clarify the distinction between syntax and semantics, right? So that's not always so clear at some points in the text. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and, you know, kind of a longer term goal is, you know, support the use of other category theoretic uh, infrastructure um, in AI, you know, you know, so for example, transformations between theories and sketches, right, imagine an AI agent that can maintain a linguistic representation of their knowledge and then, you know, transform that into a graphical, you know, a sketch based approach, um, right, so, so that's kind of my goal um, in preparing for this course. Um, a little bit about the text definition of AI and the text approach. Right, so an agent is just some entity that takes information from the environment um, with its sensors, it does something with that information, it decides on some actions, and then those actions may impact the environment, right? So the engineer's job is to figure out what's supposed to go on here. Um, so for the, these logic-based chapters, right, what's going on there is it's um, representing its knowledge in some ling linguistic fashion, right, in classical logic in the text, and then it's making inference with classical logic algorithms. Okay, so what I wanted to understand is, okay, how could we modify that to use Johnstone sequence calculus? Um, a little bit about the logical approach in the text, right? So it, it uses a really traditional approach to first order logic, right? It uses single sorted first order theories. Um, other sorts are represented as unary relations. Um, I'll say a little bit about Johnstone's approach um, in the next few slides. It uses strictly classical logic, right? So it can use formulas in place of sequence. Um, some of the terminology um, is quite a bit different from in Johnstone's text, so I needed to you know, identify how to how to translate things. Also, there's no distinction distinction among the different fragments of first order logic, which you know that's kind of surprising given the approach of the text, um, right? So in the earlier chapters, when they're talking about search algorithms, right, one measure of complexity is what's your branching factor at each stage in your search. Well, you know. If, if it would continue that um, that theme in these chapters, then that would lead to you know looking at these different fragments of logic. Um, so that's you know that's another reason for trying to to use this categorical approach. Um, also, there's you know there's no sequence calculus given, right? There's this table of rules, and there's some other tables that show up um, throughout the text. But you know one advantage of using Johnstone's approach is I can put up the slide in class and say right there it is, right there's first order logic. Um, so how do we use these rules? Um, so again, the, the text takes a traditional approach. It uses only set-based semantics. And you see statements like, um, you know, a logic must define the semantics or meaning of sentences. In standard propositional logics, every sentence must be either true or false in each possible world. There's no in-between. Well, you know, that depends on the semantics. Um, you know, 
it's easy to come up with categories in which there's more than two truth values, right? So that, you know, that's an example where it seems like the classical, you know, the kind of traditional approach to logic kind of muddies the distinction between syntax and semantics. Um, there's also statements like this last one, the rule of existential instantiation replaces an existentially quantified variable with a skolem constant. Well, you can't do that in category, categorical logic in general. Like, you know, suppose your semantics is dynamical systems, right? And you're looking at, um, you know, a two cycle. Well, a two cycle doesn't have any points, right? It doesn't have any fixed points, which are points in that category. So you can't in general replace uh, variables with, with skolem constants. Um, and then, you know, there are other details, right? Equality isn't axiomatized in the AI book. There's different treatments that are outlined, but none of the algorithms involve equality, right? So that, that's not something that came up. Uh, and then some of the notation is, is a little, you know, not quite as clean as what's in Johnstone's book. Okay, right, so I've got a few slides just to review what's um, the approach in Johnstone's text, right? So a first order signature consists of sorts, function symbols, and relation symbols. Right, so the sorts are the basic data types, and in first order logic, the only type constructor you have are product types. Um, so function symbols can take a product type as input, and they have a sort as output, and relation symbols can have can be a product type. And then the special cases are constants, which have the empty type as input, and relations or proposition symbols, which have empty type. Okay, right, so I mean, these are just slides from class. Um, and then terms, right, terms are either variables um, and each variable has a sort because we're working with multi-sorted theories um, or function symbol, or sorry, functions applied to terms, right? Where the terms all have appropriate sorts for substituting into the function symbol. Um, and then formulas, right? So this is where, you know, we identify the different fragments of logic. And, you know, one of the great contributions in the 20th century from category theory is characterizing appropriate semantic categories for these fragments of logic. Um, so this is a, a diagram I had in class, right? And you know the way I explained it here is, um, you know, these different fragments of logic have more expressive power because you have more logical connectives. And then later we could compare that to um, a similar diagram. I just had this other di semantic diagram for semant for propositional logics. And the idea here is, you know, the more expressive your language, that puts more constraints on the semantics, right? So the diagram goes in the other direction. Um, Right, so you know, so I wanted to identify in the algorithms and examples which fragments, you know, which of these fragments of logic were actually needed um, to do the algorithms and so on. Um, so next, what we need are terms and formulas in context, right? So a context is a finite list of distinct variables, um, and a context is suitable for a term if all the variables of the term occur in the top the context. Um, although the context can um, include variables that aren't in the term. And then a context suitable for a formula if all the free variables in the formula uh, occur in the context. But again, the context can have additional variables that don't occur. And that'll come up in, in some of the algorithms. Uh, and then finally, sequence or expressions of this form, right? So this is syntactic entailment, um, right? So from phi, one can prove psi in the context x. All right. So, you know, the goal is to have our knowledge based agents manipulating theories in terms of the sequence calculus. Right, you know, maintaining a you know a list of sequence to represent its knowledge and reasoning with with Johnstone sequence calculus. Um, and then you know again we get the special case uh, of well, uh, Ralph, Ralph. What was the word on the bottom? Accu uh, last ac actuators. Ac actuators. So motors or you know something that you can act on the environment with. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. That's okay. Uh huh. Um, motors, turn signals, and so on, like this taxi cab is a consistent, you know, persistent example. That it's a standard um, AI term or it's a standard logic term or what is it? Um, I don't know if it's a standard AI term, but it's, cool. yeah, it's of course, you know, yeah, I mean, certainly engineering and, you know, it's pretty standard in robotics. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Go. Just a second. I mean, now that I've got the chat right in front of my um, thing here now. There we go. OK, and then you know, um, propositional logic is a special case where your signature doesn't have any sorts. So the only type is the empty type. So you don't have function symbols. All you have are proposition symbols, right? So you know, in the first chapter um, on logic-based AI, right? this is the diagram we could have for the different fragments of logic. right? There was no regular logic because we don't have quantifiers. Um, and then, you know, in, in that early chapter, I kept the empty 
context here just kind of as a placeholder and i would tell the students you know we're going to you know keep this in mind because it's going to be a list of variables when we get to the first order stuff um right so here's the here's the sequence calculus from john stone's text um and you know for the different fragments of logic we assume different subsets of these inference rules right so for atomic logic we've got these first four boxes horn logic we add the rules for true and and uh, and so on Okay, and then you know Johnstone has some comments uh, about this. So, for example, the distributive rule, right? You need to assume that in coherent logic. But if you have you know a richer um, logic such as intuition, intuitionistic logic, where you've got the rule for implication, you can derive that one. And similarly for the Frobenius axiom, right? You assume that as a as an axiom in um, for the proof rule in regular logic. But if you're working in a fragment of logic that has implication, you can derive it. Um, Right, so here's a bunch of slides, and I don't intend to go through these. Um, but you know, there's only a few examples of using this sequence calculus in John Stone's text. So this was, you know, kind of a repository for me to work some of these out. So to give the class examples, but also to identify, okay, which sequence rules are actually needed um, in these rules. So you know, for example, you know, these were great first exercises for the class. But then you know, when we come to rules like um, um let's see let's go where's one yeah so something like this I mean, this comes up all the time in the text right the uh provable equivalence of implication and this formula right so you know one thing that's good to work out is well you can prove it in one direction without excluded middle it's the other direction where you need excluded middle right so you know an exercise is look in any logic text and find formulas like this and try to prove them with this sequence calculus right so here's my repository for all that stuff Um, yeah, so that's why I put a link to the slide so you can go through these if you want. Um, okay, so let's look at an algorithm. Um, so the first one is forward chaining for propositional logic, right? So I mean, forward chaining is nothing new. The question is, how do we kind of modify um, the algorithm from the text to use this sequence calculus? Okay, so one thing the AI text uses formulas instead of sequence. So why can, why can they do that? Um, well, there's a comment in John Stone's text that you know explains. Um, so the idea is if you have a sequent, you can derive this sequent if you have the implication rule, right? So you just use the implication rule to get all the formulas on this side. And basically what the text is doing is it's ignoring the left side of the sequent and just working with the formula. Okay, all right. So if you're working with strictly classical logic or even just intuitionistic logic, you don't have to worry about sequence. You can just use this formula that occurs here. Okay, right, so that's one thing we've got to modify um, for the algorithms. And if, we're, if we want our algorithms to work in fragments of logic that don't have this connective, um, we need to stick with the sequence. Okay, so that's one thing. Another is the, the terminology from the text, right? So the text definition of a horn clause is not the same as a horn formula or a horn sequent. Um, right, so these are, I guess, pretty standard ways of using these terms in, in engineering and AI texts. Um, so this first one says a definite clause is a disjunction of literals, right? So either an atomic formula or the negation of one, of which exactly one is positive. Okay, so if we have a formula of that form, right? So here's a conjunction or a disjunction of literals, exactly one is positive. You can derive a horn sequence, right? If you have the rule for implication. Okay, right. So the you know any place in the AI text where we see definite clauses, you know, we're pretty safe to assume that hey, we can probably translate into that and does something that we can use in horn logic, okay? Uh, but the text definition of a horn clause is a disjunction with at most one positive. Well, if none of them are positive, then the best you can do is derive one of these sequence down here where you've got negation on one, uh, not on one side or a negation on the other side. So neither of those is a horn sequence, okay? Right, so the text no, um, notion of a horn clause is not the same as a horn sequence. Right, in one of these definite clauses, you can derive a horn sequence. Okay, so the AI text mentions that hey, their their forward chaining algorithm works for definite clauses, and languages like Prolog work for definite clauses. Um, so we we should be able to convert those to things that work with horn sequence using this the sequence calculus. Okay, so that was one little detail that you know needed to get worked out. Uh, here's a theorem that that gets used in formulating the algorithm. So this is a normal form theorem from John Stone's text. So any horn formula is provably equivalent to a um, list of horn sequence of this form <clears throat> where there's no conjunction on the right side, All right? So this is just an atomic formula. 
Okay, so the, you know, the proof is easy. If you have a horn sequence of this form with a conjunction, <clears throat> you just apply and elimination and cut and you get a list of sequence of this form. Okay, so in normal form. And then conversely, if you had a list of sequence in this, in this form, you could apply uh, and introduction to get one of these back. Okay, so every horn theory or horn knowledge base in the AI text uh, terminology is provably equivalent to one where all the sequence are in this form. Okay, so that's what we'll use in the algorithm. Uh, the other little nitpicky detail in how to modify this algorithm is how to get it started. <clears throat> so what the forward chaining algorithm does is it maintains a queue of proposition symbols that you've either derived or assumed, and then you march your way through uh, the sequent rules um, and try to infer the conclusion, right? So in this example, here's our theory, right? Here's our knowledge base. You know, A and B entails D, C and D entails E, and what our AI agent wants to do is can it prove this sequence? Um, right. So the trick is, you know, in transforming this into the sequence calculus is how do you get the algorithm started? Well, in this case, <clears throat> what we start with is this Q right here, right? So we're assuming these three proposition symbols. Okay. Can we derive E? Um, and so the way the algorithm works is we maintain, you know, for each sequence in the knowledge base, we maintain a counter for the left side. So there's two proposition symbols we need to establish here. There's two on this side. And every time you, you prove one of them, you decrement the counter. And once it goes to zero, you add this to the queue. Okay. Um, right. So to start off with, the queue starts with what's on the left side of our query. So first thing we pop off the queue is A. And then we try to fit it into um, the left side of our the sequence in our knowledge base. So A is here, so this counter gets decremented to one. Um, it doesn't occur here. Then we pop B off the queue. So B also occurs here. So this counter gets decremented to zero. So we add D to our queue. Um, then we pop C off. That decrements this counter to, from two to one. Then we pop D off. That decrements this to zero. So we can infer E. And that's what we wanted to prove. Okay, so you know nothing surprising there. You know the one detail is there's another source of um, seek of proposition symbols for the initial queue if if we use this um, sequent version, and that's they can actually come from the knowledge base. If you have any sequence of this form, these get added to the queue. Okay, and then you know the inference proceeds in the same way, right? You you pop things off the queue and you try to um, set the counters to zero to get to get what you've um, the desired conclusion. Right, so here's the pseudocode. Um, so really the only modification that's needed in this algorithm is how to start the queue. Um, and here it is, right? So where the queue starts is, so we've got a knowledge base of horn sequence in standard form. Um, our query is a horn sequence in standard form. Um, and where the queue starts is any proposition symbols on the left side of our query or any proposition symbols from the knowledge base where the right-hand side, right? So here's propositions from our knowledge base. So any propositions on the right-hand side uh, where the left-hand side is simply true, okay, right? So two sources of proposition symbols for our initial queue, and then the algorithm just proceeds as, uh, as it does in, um, in standard forward chain, right? You pop something off the queue. If it's what you wanna prove, you're done. If it's not something you've seen before, then you march through the sequence and you decrement their counters if that proposition symbol occurs. Okay, so that works pretty, you know, pretty simply um, if we reformulate it with horn sequence and use um, Johnstone sequence calculus. Um, to modify the first order version um, was a little more interesting. So, you know, suppose this is our knowledge base. So true entails A of X, A of Y entails B of Y. Uh, B of Z entails C of Z. And what we want to try to derive is does T entail C of X? All well, right, you just find the right substitutions and apply cut to get this. Okay, well, so if we're using the sequence calculus, we need to be careful with the context, however. So what if our query were this, right? So it has this unused variable W, right? Could we derive that using forward chaining? Or what if there's unused variables that occur someplace else? So we've got to be a little bit more careful about um, contexts in the first order case. Okay, so, but you know, one thing that comes up in the first order um, forward chaining is you need an algorithm for substitution. Okay, so the only addition to that algorithm from what you'd see in standard uh, logic text is you need type checking because now we have multi sorted theories. Right, so what I, I used 
um, I didn't use the text, the algorithm from the AI text. I used this um, theorem from this book, Basic Proof Theory, because um, it was a lot cleaner. And you know, we ju basically just needed to add one line for type checking. Um, so here's so here's the algorithm. Uh, so first for terms, and then I'll show you the the version for formulas. Um, so this takes as input a list of terms. Okay, so uh, alpha one, alpha m are terms, beta one to beta n are terms, and you initialize it with an empty substitution, and then in the end, it's supposed to find a substitution that makes beta one equal to alpha one, beta two equal to alpha two. So it's supposed to find a substitution that makes all these terms, you know, pointwise equal to each other. Um, right. So if the two lists have different lengths, then it's not going to find a substitution. Once you don't have any terms left in there, then it returns whatever substitution it's found. And then the only addition you really need is type checking, right? So you do that at each step. If the type of this term is different from the type of this term, then you can't find a substitution that makes them equal to each other. And that's really the only addition that's needed from um, the algorithm as it's stated in, in this basic proof theory book. All right, so you know the cases are either this first term is a variable or it's not, right? Or it's a function term. And then in either of those cases, either this first one is a variable or it's not. And so you just you know, do the appropriate substitutions in either case um, to build up your substitution. And then once you're down to zero terms, you return um, whatever substitution you found. And here's, here's an example. Um, you know, this is just like from the basic uh, type theory book. And then for formulas, you know, again, type theory is the only really addition, real addition you need. It comes up in two places. One is if you have atomic formulas, I suppose, so, so the input is a list of formulas here and a list of formulas here, and you wanna find a substitution that makes them pointwise equal, and you initialize it with the empty substitution. Um, so two places where, sub, where type checking come in are, one is if your terms are both equality terms, well, then you need to make this term equal to that term and this term equal to that term. Um, so type checking would come up in the unified terms there. Or if you have two atomic formulas that are, involve relation symbols, um, then you need to um, find a substitution that makes the terms you know, pointwise equal. All right, so that's one place where type checking would come in. Another is if you have um, quantified variables so the sorts of the, so a substitution is not gonna impact the, the quantified variables, whatever they are, uh, but you want the types or the sorts of the quantified variables to be equal to each other, right? So there's type checking there. And then the rest of this is just making sure that you're, when you find a substitution, it doesn't conflict with any of the variables that occurred freely uh, otherwise uh, in the formulas. Okay, so you know, bottom line is uh, modifying unification just uh, involves introducing type checking because now we're working with multi-sorted theories, All right? And here's an example of that. Okay, so now how does the first order uh, forward chaining work? All right, so let's get back to that. So here's an example where the contexts don't cause any trouble. Um, so here we just need to find substitutions and apply cut, but so I'll, this will illustrate what the procedure is. So here's our knowledge base, right? True entails A of W, A of X entails B of X, B of Y entails C of Z, and our query is, can we prove that T entails right, C of Z, right? Can we derive this sequence? Um, okay, so what's a little different here is in our Q, we don't just have formulas, we need to keep track of the context, right? So to initialize the Q, right, there's just like in the propositional cases, there's two sources uh, for our initial Q. One is the left side of our query. Well, that doesn't give us anything. And the other source is the right side of sequence in the knowledge base where the left side is true. So here's the only, um, contribution to the initial Q, right? So it's this formula in context, right? W in the context, or sorry, A of W in the context W. Okay, so that's the that's our initial Q. And on the right side here, um, I show what the proof is that's being constructed uh, along this procedure. <clears throat> okay, so here's, um, here's our initial hypothesis, um, right? So we're using this. So what we need to do is we check what's in the queue and does that unify with any of the left sides um, in sequence in our, in our knowledge base, All right? In the propositional case, what we'd be doing is taking proposition symbols off and trying to decrement the counters. Well, it's not so simple in the first order case. What we need to do is find um, 
formulas in context that are in our queue and see if those unify with things on the left side. Um, and then, you know, if we can satisfy the left side of one of um, the sequence in the um, knowledge base, then we can add the right side to the queue. All right, so that's what, what happens here is, so A of W in the context W is in our queue, it unifies with X in the context A of X, right? So we would need to unify these two formulas in context and the substitution, right, substitute W for X works. So we apply that substitution to rule two um, in our knowledge base, and that gives us this sequence, right? So just using the substitution rule from Johnstone's sequence calculus. <clears throat> and then we can apply cut directly to uh, infer this sequence. Okay, so then B of W in the context W, that doesn't unify with anything that's in our Q yet. So we add that to the Q. And what we should also check is does B of W in the context W, does that unify with what we're looking for? And it does not, so we continue. Okay, so now we've got B of W in the context W in our, in our Q. Um, <clears throat> we check, does that unify with the left side of anything in our knowledge base? And it does, it unifies with um, B of Y in the context Y. Okay, via the substitution W for Y. So we apply that substitution to rule three uh, from our knowledge base, and that gives us this, right? So that's, again, just applying the substitution rule from Johnstone's sequence calculus. Um, and then we can apply cut to this and this to derive this sequence. <clears throat> okay, so then C of W in the context W does not unify with anything that's in our Q. Um, so we add it to the Q, but it does unify with what we're trying to conclude right, via the substitution Z for W. So we apply that substitution and that's what we're trying to derive. Okay, so that's a case of this forward chaining uh, using the sequence calculus where, you know, nothing funny goes, goes on with the, the contexts. Um, in order to look at a case where something does happen that we need to pay attention to, uh, I just wanna review the, the weakening rule uh, from John Stone's text. Okay, so if you look at the substitution rule, um, what this says is, you know, from a sequence phi entails psi, if you substitute terms for the variables in this context, then you can derive this sequence as long as the context Y is suitable for both terms or for both formulas. Okay, in particular, this Y can include variables that don't occur on either side, right? As long as it's sufficient for both sides, um, you know, this is a, a valid inference rule, right? So weakening is a special case where you just apply the dummy substitution for all the variables and just introduce some new variables, right? Because this new context will be suitable for both, right? So in other words, it's okay to introduce new variables uh, through the substitution rule. And so that's called weakening. Okay, so how do we use that in this algorithm? Um, so let's have a, a problem where that comes up. So here's the same knowledge base we had before, but suppose our query has this, um, this unused variable. You know, can we still apply this algorithm and the sequence calculus to get there? Well, the first part of this procedure is the same as what we just had before until we get down to this last step. Um, so we've derived this, and then the question is, does C of W in the context W, does that unify with what we want? And it does using one of these dummy substitutions, right? We substitute Z for W, but we also sub introduce this dummy variable Y, right? We substitute, or, sorry, V. We substitute B for B. So that gives us this context. Okay, so right, so as long as um, the extra variables occur in the right place, then it doesn't cause much trouble. Um, but there's other cases where it can, <clears throat> and that's this last example. Um, so what I've got here is now our knowledge base, one of the sequence, the one that gets us started, has this extra variable. So the question is, can we still derive this sequence? Okay, so this extra variable is going to get maintained um, throughout the procedure here. So we initialize the Q to, well, there's nothing here to contribute. So this is what we use to initialize the Q. So A of W in the context V and W. Okay, so basically what we're using is, is this sequence. Okay, so next, does this thing that we have in the Q, does that unify with the left-hand sides of any of our, um, of our sequence rules? And yes, it does, right? It, it um, unifies with A of X in the context X, 
via one of these dummy substitutions, right? So as long as we apply substitution and add an extra variable as we go, then we can drive this sequence by substitution, right? So that's a valid application of the substitution rule. And then we can apply cut to get the next step. Okay, so then B of W in the context V W that doesn't unify with anything we have in the queue. So we add it to the queue um, and it doesn't, it also does not unify with what we're trying to prove. So we keep going, All right? Um, so then we check, you know, does B of W in the context VW, does that uh, unify with any of the left sides? Yes, it unifies with axiom three, right? Via the substitution um, W for Y, but also you add this dummy variable or this, you know, unused variable V, right? So we apply weakening again um, to get this rule. So that's just applying a substitution to se the sequence three from the knowledge base. And then apply cut to six and seven that we have here to derive this. All right. So now the question is, you know, so C of W in the context of B of W is not in the Q, so we would add it to the Q. But the question is, does it unify with what we're trying to prove? And it depends, right? So um, if V and W are of the same sort, then we can just substitute W for V. Uh, I guess we can substitute Z for both to get this. So if V and W have the same sort. Um, then yes, we can derive what we're after. Uh, and there's a comment in Johnstone's text, that, you know, if the sort has a closed term of whatever sort V is, then we can remove the variable, but there aren't any closed terms in our knowledge base. So no, we can't derive this sequence from this knowledge base. Okay, so we've got to be a little more careful there um, in the first order case to keep track of what the context is because um, Weakening allows us to introduce new variables, but in general, we can't just get rid of variables unless uh, we already have variables of that sort in our context, um, or if we have some closed terms in our knowledge base. Okay, right. So, I mean, this is essentially like um, first order um, forward chaining from the text, but we, you know, we've got to be a little more careful in keeping track of, of contexts, right? So our Q is formulas in context, not just formulas. Um, and then in the end, Right, we, when we want to see, well, can we derive the sequence we're after? Um, well, first of all, check if you can unify the two. And even if you can't, um, is there a smaller context that you can obtain by either weakening or allowing deletion of variables by looking for constant terms? Okay, all right, so a couple of little tweaks that are needed to kind of the, the traditional algorithm for, for first order forward chain. Um, Another algorithm I looked at was resolution, right? So there's a lot of discussion in the text of first order resolution, and it's strictly a classical construction the way the book does it, right? So the, the way the text does, the AI text does resolution theorem proofs is, you know, if you're trying to prove, um, you know, some formula phi, you assume it's negation and derive a contradiction, right? So, but what it's using is rules that look like this. Um, so I wondered, you know, can we get away? So I don't have an algorithm for this yet. I just have, I've worked out a couple of examples from the deck, the text and found that you don't have to have um, excluded middle, right? You don't have to prove them by contradiction. Um, I know there's some work out there in intuitionistic um, resolution proving. I wanted to see what I could figure out with this particular sequence calculus. Okay, right. So here's one um, resolution rule that, that you can use to kind of reformulate some of the examples from the text that isn't that isn't a classical uh, theorem, right? So if P entails Q and R, Q or R, and P entails not R, then one can derive Q, right, without excluded middle, right? And here's the proof rules, um, just using Johnstone's sequence calculus, um, right? So this would be a, an intuitionistic uh, version of resolution um, if you reformulate your knowledge base. And I've got an example of that from the text. Um, you can also do this with just coherent logic, but you can't use negation, right? So if P entails Q or R, and then you've got that P or R, or sorry, P and R entails false, then you can still derive Q without excluded middle, right? Using Johnstone sequence calculus. Um, so the example from the book, um, it's so there's this kind of persistent example through these logic chapters called the Wumpus world. And so what that is, is there's an agent that you drop into this maze. And he's supposed to navigate the maze and find the goals and get out without either falling into a pit or getting eaten by a wumpus. Okay, and the inference he has to do is um, if there's a pit in a square, then all the adjacent squares, uh, the agent can 
detect a breeze, right? So um, like when he moves to this square, he detects a breeze. So he knows there's a pit either here or here. Um, and the other inference he can do is if there's a wumpus in a particular square, then the agent can detect a stench in the adjacent squares. Um, and that'll be on the next next slide, right? So he, you know, by moving around the, the maze, he can you know, get information about which squares may or may not have pits or wumpuses and then infer where it's safe to move and where it's not safe to move. Okay, right, so these num this numbering is, is um, just a reformulation of the formulas from the text, right, using this, this sequent calculus. And, you know, what, what we get down to is what the agent does is he starts here, he doesn't detect a breeze or a stench, right? So this square is okay, those two squares are okay. Then he moves here and he detects a breeze, so there's a pit either here or here. All right, so he doesn't want to move here. He doesn't want to move here. So he moves back, then he moves up here. Okay, and when he's there, he detects a stench, but not a breeze. So what he, he should be able to do is, well, there's a breeze either here or here. There's not a breeze here. So he should be able to conclude that there's a pit here. And the proof in the book, you know, again, is strictly classical, right? He, uh, he assumes the negation of something and proves a contradiction. Um, but you can get away with this intuitionistic um, oops, sorry, this intuitionistic version of, um, of resolution to derive the same thing, at least in this case, right? So again, you know, I don't have a general algorithm for this, but just working through um, the example from the text, you know, you can get away with, uh, with not using classical inference, right? Just proving this directly using this intuitionistic approach. Um, so the other algorithms in the, uh, the text involve, um, so there's a few algorithms that involve semantics, um, but they're all just satisfaction algorithms uh, for propositional logic. So here's a couple slides on categorical semantics. Um, you know, so you know, again, the, the algorithms only involve um, propositional um, theorems. So here's, here's the diagram I showed the class on prop propositional logics, right? So classical logic, you need a, your ordered set of, um, of truth values is, is a Boolean algebra and so on, right? So you have you know, fewer constraints on your semantics if you have a less expressive logic. Um, and then to review categorical semantics from John Stone's book, um, sorts are interpreted as objects. Um, the empty type is interpreted as the terminal object in you know, whatever category you're using for semantics. Product types are interpreted as product objects. Function symbols are interpreted as morphisms. Um, relation symbols are interpreted as subobjects. So, in particular, um, proposition symbols are interpreted as subobjects of the terminal object. Okay, All right. So that you know, so that's something we can we can show in class is um, examples of semantics where you have more than just true and false. So, I'll show some examples in a second. Uh, and then, terms in context are interpreted as morphisms, and formulas in context are interpreted as Subobjects, and you know, if you want to see the constructions, here's the theorems in, in John Stone's text um, for how to get these things. Um, and then John Stone's, you know, presents soundness and com completeness theorems, which characterize, you know, for given fragments of first-order logic, here are the classes of categories that are appropriate for the semantics. Um, okay, so you know, the kind of things I could show in class are, well, you're familiar with truth-value semantics uh, for propositional logics. You've also seen Venn diagrams, um, right? So here's a quote from a, a recent book, right? So category theory, which works with functions, processes, and structures is uniquely qualified to present the fundamental results of computer <laughs> science. And you know, I think this is just a dramatic example of that. I mean, these are just two basic things that our students see you know, in lower level classes. And they're just special cases of this much richer um, you know, theory. You know, it's just semantics of propositional, you know, of the propositional connectives in sets and slice categories over sets, right? Two of the first categories they would meet if they looked at category theory at all. So I, I think that's just, you know, a great example of, of how this, you know, the impact of categorical logic, you know, on you know, fundamental math. Um, a couple of other, other examples I presented were, okay, so the book says there's only two truth values. Well, it depends on your semantics, right? You don't have to look at very exotic categories to find other examples. Right, so look at the category of directed graphs, right? The terminal object there is the graph with one node and, uh, or one vertex and one edge. So that has three objects, right? Or three sub objects. So there's your three truth values. 
here's intuitionistic semantics, right? It's not classical. And so an exercise for class would you know, show that these are sound, um, so that the semantics is sound for these same inference rules. All right, and that works for any you know, totally word set. Um, another example we talked about in class is you know, the text mentions fuzzy logic. Uh, and you know what I, you know, the way I explained it to them, well, it's not the logic that's fuzzy, right? It's the semantics, right? We can still use the same sequence rules, right? The syntax is the same, right? What's different is you know, what semantic category you're looking at. And there's, there's been lots of work by category theorists on different categories of fuzzy sets, right? So this one that I used in class was one of the ones from Barr and Wells. Um, there's another example in, in that text, which is a topo. So that was a little more complicated to describe to class. So I just used this one, um, which was much simpler for, for them. Um, but again, you know, you can just write out what semantics are of the logical connectives and they can check, you know, are these sound and complete, or they can check soundness. Okay, right. So, you know, again, the, the approach in this AI text and, you know, kind of the traditional approach is, um, you know, classical semantics for, or set-based semantics for classical logic. Um, but you get much richer structure if you, you know, without a lot of work by using this, this categorical approach. Okay, so the algorithms um, from the text, uh, there, were, there were some satisfaction algorithms for propositional theories. One of them is this truth table and tails algorithm. And so all that does is, um, so given a knowledge base, right? So given a propositional theory, um, if you look in every assignment of um, truth values that makes the knowledge base true is a sequent truth, right? So does the knowledge base sem semantically entail the sequent? Right, so what this algorithm does is it just exhaustively enumerates all the truth value assignments to the proposition symbols, right? And then you look, um, you know, you look, well, so let me look at an example. So here's an example, right? So the one, one I did in class is here's our knowledge base, here's our query, right? So this is just one direction of the implication rule. So what we wanna do is exhaustively list the assignments of truth values and every place where this is true is the, um, the query true. Well, it's pretty straightforward to generalize the, the algorithm from the text to having more than true, two truth values, um, right? So here's, you know, semant here's checking this in the category of directed graphs where there's two, tr three truth values. Um, yeah, I mean, computational complexity is an issue, but um, so what the algorithm needs to do, it needs to recursively enumerate um, these assignments of truth values. It needs to be able to compute semantics of the connectives, right? So in directed graphs, and then it needs to be able to check, right? Is the knowledge base true, right? And then in any case where the knowledge base is true, is the sequence true, right? So here's the algorithm. So really the only thing that needs to be changed from the algorithm in the text is instead of recursively calling the algorithm with, um, so what it does is it, it, it takes the, the proposition symbols and then it recursively calls the algorithm with that proposition symbol true and false. And then it checks, you know, is if the knowledge base is true, does the sequence have to be true? So all we have to do is mod to modify that is just loop through whatever truth values we have, right? Assuming we have a finite set of truth values, right? So that's pretty straightforward to, to adapt to this categorical approach. Um, so is the walksat algorithm, right? So what this does is given a propositional knowledge base, it tries to find um, an assignment of truth values that makes it true, right? So in some cases it can fail. Um, so you give it a, a finite amount of time to work. And what it does is, so here, this P is a probability of either um, randomly flipping a truth value or being very careful about which truth value you, you change, okay? All right, so there's two, two sides to this, right? There's a randomness side and then there's more, um, more measured side. So, so what the algorithm does is it randomly selects, well, first it randomly assigns truth values um, to the proposition symbols. And then you randomly select one, um, one sequent that is not satisfied by your truth value assignment. And then either you're gonna randomly flip um, a truth value or you're gonna do this other step, right? So the other step is you count how many sequents are satisfied in your current assignment of truth values, okay? Um, and then you know to adjust this to the categorical approach, um, you pick some truth value that maximizes the number of other sequence that are satisfied, right? So you find some truth value in an unsatisfied um, sequence, and you find the new truth value that optimize, you know, that maximizes the number of sequence that are satisfied. 
And that's, you know, that's trivial to adapt to having more than two truth values. Um, right, so, so I mean, I guess the bottom line is, you know, a lot of these algorithms as presented in this standard AI text are pretty straightforward to adapt um, to this categorical approach. You know, where it gets a little tricky is, you know, one, when they're introducing scolum constants for existentially quantified variables, and another when we need to be a little more careful about how to keep track of the contexts um, in substitutions. All right, so that's all I had for, for today. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, any questions? Uh, I, have a, I have a pedagogical question. To, to what extent did the students appreciate it, the categorical, as opposed to what they were reading in the book? In, a, in other words, I would love to do what you did. Tell mm -hmm. me, is it worth it? In other words, did they were they able to follow it? Were they able to appreciate it? They they were. So I mean, I mean, when I was an undergrad, I you know I took logic and I failed miserably, right? So I had a long, difficult history with trying to learn logic because of some of the issues, right? This fuzziness between syntax and semantics. There's not seeing this is the sequence calculus. So I think having that stuff so clearly presented as it is in John Stone's book helped a lot, you know, as opposed to some of the, you know, the presentation in the text, the AI text. So, so, so they worked their way through, you gave them out a chapter of, of Johnson's text or, or? No, so these slides that I showed you, that's mostly slides from class, right? So I did not give them John Stone's text. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, not you know, a lot of them were not math majors, right? So there were some cybersecurity majors um, and some computer science majors. Um, so yeah, so these slides that I showed you, that's a lot of the material we used uh, in class. So another issue though, pedagogically is software, right? So like when it came to actually implementing some of these examples, there isn't software for using Johnstone's calculus, sequence calculus. I started on some last summer, but you know, certainly not done. So, you know, we used Prover 9, um, but, you know, we had to transform stuff into the appropriate language for that. And then um, the text comes with its own um, software, you know, some JavaScript, some Java programs that you can use. But again, that's not using the Suki calculus that I was trying to teach them. Very nice, very nice. Anyways, any other questions? Anyways, Ralph? Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, Thanks for the invitation. Presence. It's good to see you. Um, all right, so um, we're meeting in two weeks, whether in person or online. Either way, we'll 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 do it. Um, so live stream it, right? Um, Emilio Minchali is talking about category theory, um, intersect differential geometry. So that should be interesting. Anyways. You're all welcome. It's a pleasure seeing you all. And um, thank you very much. Okay.